invite Nancy to come. And here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to see everyone here. My name is Nancy Curry Atkinson. And on behalf of Presbyterian Women United, it is my pleasure to welcome you today. And um, both those here with us and those on Zoom, is that Zoom? Okay. Um, so the topic for today's program is the history of women in the Presbyterian Church. The perfect topic for Women's History Month. As I know as a woman myself, Growing up, there were obstacles and blockades I encountered as I navigated um, what we were allowed to do and the avenues that were not open to us because we were women. Thank goodness, things are finally changing. We have a very special guest with us today, and I would like to invite Dr. Tom Rice, our pastor for discipleship, to introduce her. Thank you, Nancy, and welcome, everyone. I, I want to start, as we do as Presbyterian women, with a devotion and a prayer. And I'd like us to attend to the scriptures, to Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28. Listen for God's word. To us. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. I wanted us to think about that passage briefly because it is beautiful and important and hard. I've experienced it being lived out in small and big ways, and I've experienced the church far from living out those words. And sometimes here in our church, Margaret, we've added, for there is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, Wolverine nor Buckeye. <laughs> Because I'm from Michigan, my wife's from Michigan, here we are in Buckeye country, and, and the beauty and power of the gospel is to overcome what would separate us. One thing that I didn't fully appreciate when I first started at a church in DeKalb, Illinois, Westminster Presbyterian Church. That's where I was ordained and installed. They had different rooms, different classrooms, meeting rooms, each with a name, but not named after a church member or a pastor, but named after important people, saints. Christian leaders, like the Calvin room and the Luther room and the Towner room. Yes, Margaret, my really? campus ministry group met every week in the Towner room named after you. So mm. I was taught about you as I started at that church. And I didn't fully appreciate how many people were not as fortunate as I. How many churches did not have a towner room, but should have a towner room. 
That's one experience of maybe living towards Paul's teaching, towards the gospel. When Betsy and I were seeking our first calls, so Margaret, my wife is a Presbyterian pastor too. We visited some churches and interviewed. I visited a church in Kentucky. I visited a church in Virginia. And those churches, after interviewing me, said things like, well, your wife could teach school here. <laughs> they, they were clear that she could not serve as a pastor in their presbytery. This was 1992. So that is how far sometimes our church is from living out those words of the gospel. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for this time together, and thank you for Margaret, and thank you for the privilege of learning about your word, about your good news, and help us, oh God, to live it out more and more fully. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. I want to introduce you, Margaret, and I want to provide just a little bit more context. Who, who knows what happened in 1920? Women's suffrage. Women's suffrage. Yep. Also, in 1920 was the first time the General Assembly received an overture for women to be ordained as elders and as pastors, 1920. 1930, women in the Presbyterian Church were first ordained as elders. 1956, Margaret Towner was ordained, the first woman in the Presbyterian Church ordained. It took 36 years from that first effort. When Margaret was ordained, there was a five page spread in Life magazine. When Margaret was ordained, it was broadcast on national media. That's how historic, that's how important it was. Today, is equal pay day. In other words, this is the day that women would have to work to if they worked all of 2022 and this many days of 2023, they would earn as much as a man doing the same job working for 2022. This is... Uh, an important time to talk about what is it like to be a woman in the Presbyterian Church? What is it like to be a woman in our country? And how can we be more faithful? So, Margaret Towner, it is an honor to welcome you. And I'd like to start by asking you a question just to get the ball rolling. And then as you said, we'll have a conversation, but I don't know if you wanna say anything first before the first question. I uh, appreciate your, your introduction and the, the stories that you told because they are all uh, resonating in my mind. Um, I remember shortly after I was ordained, um, I was uh, at a church in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and uh, the other pastor, the other assistant pastor, we were two assistants, um, had um, uh, a reasonably good salary, and I went into the trustees and, and asked for a salary commensurate 
with uh, Walt Fitton. And um, they were very, very um, insulting. They said, no, you'll get married and be taken care of. So that was the introduction that I got in terms of asking for equal pay as an assistant pastor, having spent uh, one more year uh, than uh, the other assistant uh, in the ministry. Uh, I think that um, there is a, still is a struggle. Um, I was <clears throat> ordained, I think, because um, the uh, pastors at First Presbyterian Church in Syracuse, where I had uh, gone after college and after serving a, a year as a medical photographer at Mayo Clinic, um, <clears throat> I was got involved in the, uh, in the church. Um, I had sort of rejected the church for a while. Um, it was primarily over... Um, the divorce of my parents. My father had been a Presbyterian minister, and uh, uh, but uh, they were divorced, and that hit me kind of hard. And so I rejected uh, the church for quite a while. And uh, when I went back to Syracuse, where my family had moved after I had, while I was in college, um, I uh, was. Um, working for Syracuse University, and um, I was, um, I call it, I was tricked into going to uh, meet the uh, pastor at First Presbyterian Church, Harry Taylor, um, and uh, so I begrudgingly went in to uh, him and uh, visited with him, and uh, at the time, I let my emotions out and my anger out. And he said, thank you for sharing. And uh, I said, gee, if a pastor is like that, maybe uh, I could come here uh, and get involved. Well, I did. I got involved in the, the church in, in Syracuse and I got involved in uh, another church in Syracuse as uh, helping the pastor. I had been uh, growing up in church choirs from the time I was in kindergarten on. So I stayed in singing in church choirs. But I think that uh, I got involved in the church um, in Syracuse and, and then in uh, East Genesee uh, Presbyterian Church as uh, helping the pastor with the youth program. And the more I got involved in the church, the more um, uh, Harry uh, Taylor and then Bill McConaughey, who came after Harry at First Press, they began to say, why don't you begin to investigate ministry? And I said, well, I, I hadn't thought about it. And they said, well, you know, we have a scattergood scholarship and um, we would like to have you be a recipient of the Scattergood Scholarship at Union Seminary in New York, Union Auburn. So um, having got, been involved for three years now in the church, I said, well, nothing can hurt it if I go. I began to feel that the church is where I belonged and I got to seminary. And uh, as I got involved in the classes, uh, I had a deeper feeling of that, that's where I belonged. And, and then the rest is the story. I do feel that the pastors in Syracuse um, were a little anxious to have, uh, uh, when, when the ordination of women was voted on, I had a feeling that some of the Syracuse pastors were a little anxious uh, to uh, have uh, somebody from, uh, from there to be ordained. So uh, they, they did push me into getting finished at seminary rather quickly and, and getting uh, through the examinations at Syracuse uh, Cayugas Presbytery. And uh, I was examined and accepted. And then, of course, it's all history. 
uh, as you mentioned, it's uh, history in Life magazine and in Time magazine and in in uh, uh, Horizons magazine, uh, a, a lot of it. So in a way, that's a little bit different uh, answer to some of the things that maybe you were expecting. Yeah. Um, I think it uh, it fits into a little one of the other questions that uh, you you were asking, and that is, what about the status of women today? Um, it was an interesting question. So I was on a Zoom meeting yesterday with uh, five of my, my spiritual daughters. Uh, the women who are been ordained since are called my spiritual daughters. Anyway, I was on a, a Zoom meeting with them, um, and I asked them what they felt is the status of women uh, in ministry today. And uh, one of them said, well, it's better than it was, but it still has a long way to go. And another one of them, I thought, was had many good thoughts uh, about it. She said that, on the one hand, Women are serving competently and successfully in so many places. We have become the norm, norm rather than the exception. On the other hand, she said, women are both the present and the future of church leadership. There is a difficulty yet to be overcome. It's a hard, it's hard to name but the problem has to do with the lack of familiarity. That's interesting. That, that, that sort of tangled my interest. Uh, nearly all of us grew up with male pastors, which is true. Even when churches call very competent women, that longing for the familiar remains deep in people, though most of the time we don't realize it. A lot of us yearn for that male spiritual leader that we remember. And I thought that was kind of an interesting thought in terms of what's, what is still going on. Uh, in most places, it is um, uh, women are very much accepted. As a matter of fact, there is a growing number of uh, women who are heads of staff now. Hmm. Uh, not, but And then some of them, there are two women co-pastors, heads of staff. So I think we are making progress in some parts of the nation. I think that down in the area where I live in the Southern tier of our country, I, I think there's still uh, a lot of work to be done. Now, maybe you've got some better questions that I can answer. <laughs> Um, quick question, while, while people think, um, how many spiritual daughters do you have now? Well, about five years ago, there were 5,000. And it's grown. <laughs> I just participated in the installation ordination of two other women here in Sarasota. Uh, two women who are uh, ordained and installed as assist associate pastors of the Church of the Palms uh, here in Sarasota. And the Church of the Palms now has um, five women associate pastors and one man. <clears throat> and it's it's the largest church in our in our presbytery. Wow. That's great. Okay, other questions? People, yes, Ursula. Is the, is the gentleman that is one of his five in charge, or is he another associate pastor? So at that church with so many female pastors, is the male the head of staff or one of the associate yes. pastors? He is, he is head of staff. Okay. Yeah. And, and that is a, a new phenomenon because when he 
came to the church, there was uh, there was just one female associate, mm. and there were two uh, uh, male uh, retired pastors who were visitation pastors, and that one female was the associate. Okay, Carol. Uh, did you feel you were accepted when you first went to seminary? As there were probably all men there as well. How how well were you accepted in seminary as being one of the only, if not the only, woman? Okay, I went to Union Seminary, Union Auburn Theological Seminary in New York City. Um, <clears throat> I had applied at Princeton, but they didn't want any women. Oh. Union oh. Seminary was different because Union at Auburn was an ecumenical seminary, and it had students from the United Church of Christ, then the Congregational Christian, uh, the Methodist Church, Presbyterian Church, the Episcopal Church. We even had a woman there from the Seventh-day Adventists, although she did not stay there. Evidently, she just didn't feel uh, she fit in there. And uh, so we were quite ecumenical. In my, uh, in my class, uh, there was a, a, a gal from uh, Pittsburgh uh, who was a Methodist deacon, and she was there studying towards ordination as a Methodist pastor. Um, and that intrigued me because uh, at seminary, uh, Dr. Van Dusen, who was president at the time, invited a woman uh, who was pastor of six of seven churches in northern Maine. And it was in one of those churches that, that Dr. Van Dusen worshipped in the summertime. And so he brought this woman uh, to Union Seminary every year for her study leave. And I got to know her and she was a Methodist. She was ordained uh, by the permission of the Methodist Conference uh, as Methodist women were not ordained yet officially, but the conference ordained her to serve as pastor of these seven churches. And uh, she's written a wonderful book and, and I've loaned it to somebody and it never comes back. So um, it's called Seven Steeples. Uh, her name is Margaret Henderson. Anyway, um, we got to know Margaret Henderson there. And uh, so she was a, a shining example of a woman ordained. Um, there was this, this young woman from Pittsburgh. Um, I'll share this funny story. Our first night we had, as a living scholarship, we lived in the James Mansion in uh, 69th and Park Avenue. And there were, uh, there were just uh, 10 of us women. And then there was one woman who was studying for her doctorate who was a sort of house mother. And we met the first night we were all there in her apartment and uh, or her the master bedroom is what she lived in and uh, we introduced ourselves and, and I remember this Methodist gal Marjean Lynn uh, said well I'm Marjean Lynn and I'm a Methodist and uh, I come from Pittsburgh and my fam family is in the iron and steel business. My mother irons and my father steals. <laughs> <laughs> my Jean went on to become um, a, a, an ordained. There was another gal uh, who was a Presbyterian and she was studying for uh, the ministry. So um, there were maybe six of us women uh, Presbyterians that were studying for ministry. That's a long answer to a, a very good question. That's great. Yes, Deanna. At your first pastorate, how were you received? How did the congregation treat you? 
Could you hear that? How were you treated? Not too well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Say more. Okay. Yeah. Um, how were you? Yeah. How were you treated at your first church after your ordination when you went to First Presbyterian Church of Allentown? How did they receive you and treat you? Um, well, it was a mixed. Uh, it was a mixture of uh, acceptance and a mixture of um, um, curiosity. Um, basically, I was received very well by most of the members of the congregation. Um, the Women's Association uh, was very supportive. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they presented me with a, uh, a communion uh, set for home communions, a beautiful box with a, uh, the, the silver uh, and the, the glass. And it, it, uh, it was in my possession and I used it faithfully in my ministry. It now resides in the, um, in what they call a um, memorial or a, a, a place that they have set aside for interesting things in Allentown. So I sent it back there where the women gave me that. They were very accepting and uh, uh, often asked me to participate or answer questions. Um, the members of the choir were very accepting. Um, the, the youth program uh, people were most accepting and uh, they were uh, very supportive and I built up quite a, an interesting youth program there at the Allentown Church. Uh, there was always the, the question of, um, you know, uh, why did you decide to get uh, here? And the pastor uh, was really did not support ordination of women, but he had very little uh, <laughs> influence to stop it because um, when ordination came uh, available, uh, my home pastor in Syracuse wrote to him and said that um, he would like to help facilitate the, uh, my ordination. And uh, so he didn't have much of a, a chance to, to act negatively. So what I did is uh, I invited he and the other assistant minister to participate in Syracuse in my ordination. And uh, uh, what he said was, well, I, I hope you'll stay here at Allentown until you get married. They're always assuming that, you know, the next step is you're going to get married and, and be taken care of. Um, but um, they went up and the choir from Allentown voted to go. And so the choir went up to the Syracuse ordination event. I guess that answers your question for the first church that I serve. The, the first church that I served before ordination um, in Washington, D.C. was another story. The pastor was uh, very difficult to get along with, and uh, uh, but I had the total support of the session of that church and uh, built up uh, quite a youth program. Another question. Yes. I'm curious about how important the politics, kind of conservative versus progressive, at that time was in thinking about what denomination you want to go to. And, and like for Presbyterian, I know there were two branches in there. Just reading on my internet. <laughs> Could you say something about the politics of being 
progressive or being conservative and how that influences you, how, how that impacted you in choosing what denomination? <clears throat> well, yes, that's a good question. Um, and I'm glad that I uh, attended an ecumenical seminary. Um, I was um, brought up in the Presbyterian Church. Um, and um, although my mother's ancestry, who uh, were the pioneers in Iowa near the Amana colonies, they were Swedenborg. They brought that from Germany. But um, in summers when I was out in Iowa at the farm, uh, I would attend the Methodist Church, but I was basically uh, grew up in the Presbyterian Church in the children's choir and the youth choirs and so on. And uh, <clears throat> Carleton, of course, where I went college is uh, was a Methodist uh, uh, college. So when I went to uh, go to seminary, I decided that I wanted to explore. Uh, what denomination I really would relate to. Uh, during high school, I sang in the uh, high school choirs, and the high school choir was the church's, uh, congregational church's choir. But it was uh, also ecumenical. The, pres the minister was a Presbyterian. Um, so, uh, but the United Church of Christ was of interest to me because I had known a lot of people in, in that. I, I say United Church of Christ because that's what it is now, but it was congregational Christian when I was going to school and until a few years ago. Um, but as I got involved, uh, <clears throat> the, the ministers uh, that I related to and the pastors and the teachers, um, they were Presbyterian, Robert McAfee Brown and uh, uh, some of the others were, and uh, Pitney Van Dusen and so on. So um, I felt that the polity of the Presbyterian church uh, was um, a, a more, a, an equal, uh, I like the fact that uh, there were different uh, responsibilities. There were different governing bodies. I like the fact that, that they were all related to one another, that the session was the body of the local congregation and that the session had been represented in the presbytery and, and you got to know other people and you studied with others in other churches in that presbytery. And then it was a broader relationship with the synod. And then the general assembly, of course, is the uh, seat of uh, many of our uh, exciting and wonderful uh, actions to really help the church grow and become enlivened. Whereas um, uh, you had the background as a pastor, you had the security of a presbytery and of a synod and general assembly. As a United Church of Christ, you did not have that security. The, uh, in my experience, uh, if a, a congregational council wanted to get you out, you can, they can dis dismiss you. Whereas the presbytery is your, your guide. The presbytery is what we belong to. Uh, and so they are our, our help and, and salvation in case of, of uh, problems, which uh, <clears throat> I had when I served in Indianapolis. Uh, Indianapolis, uh, church um, was um, an interesting thing. The minister, the presbytery said, the minister was very jealous of you. And we think maybe, uh, you know, we, we should uh, support you, but uh, you better look for something else. So, which is interesting. 
<laughs> a very insecure person. Does that answer the question? Yes. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Others? Yes, Betsy. Margaret, I'm going to stand up, and you're probably still not going to be able to hear me, but I think the camera's there. Yeah. I'm Betsy Rice, so I'm married to Tom Rice. I am one of your 5,000-plus um, daughters because I'm a Presbyterian <laughs> John, pastor. Why don't you come here? Come on up. Come on up to the uh, microphone so I can see you. And it's it's just right. the vision of labor in this church that Tom serves the Presbyterian women and I have a different job description. <laughs> we we try not to have any hard feelings. <laughs> so um you and I have grown up in a generation where your adjectives count for a lot. Um I'm wondering what what you see. I don't think we're beyond that yet. But um, what are the issues that you are now seeing in the Presbyterian Church or maybe just Christianity um, in the U.S.? Uh, because we're not, we are not the only game in town. That's right. Well, what's worrying me the most is the ultra-conservative um, group that is growing up that is, uh, in my interpretation, misinterpreting the uh, the scriptures uh, to to fit their own political bias and uh, I think that's one of the things that uh, scares me is uh, the ultra conservative group that is um, infiltrating into the uh, politics of our government and of our nation and uh, I'm I guess, the clergy women that I have talked to, we're all feeling uh, a attention and and a concern because um, it, it's more difficult now to counteract the um, the biases and and the the narrow interpretation of scripture and and the application of the relationship of church and state is um, is getting thin by their definition. And I guess that's what scares me the most. Uh, it would be interesting to know uh, what some of the clergy women are feeling uh, in, in your area of, of the world. But um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm feeling rather um, frustrated and insecure uh, right now in terms of uh, the health of the Protestant churches. Um, and uh, I guess just the fact that the whole um, political situation is infiltrating the church. And I guess I'm feeling that we as a church probably ought to get more involved in speaking up to the injustices that are uh, rampant, uh, injustice towards uh, uh, other human beings of, of uh, race, uh, of color, uh, of uh, gender. Um, I think um, it just, it just makes me very insecure and I'm fighting constantly in my mind. I have lots of letters to the editor that I'm writing in my mind that I need to try to get uh, in, into, the, into the papers uh, to try to bolster up the support of, of women of all races, nationalities, and genders, and um, persuasions. Does that come at what you were getting at? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Ursula. Are there many women now at your seminary? She's asking if there are many women now entering sanctuary or seminary. Sorry. Hello? Yes. Um, she's asking 
Are there many women now entering seminary? Yes, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, um, one of my <clears throat> uh, one of my daughters that was on the Zoom uh, yesterday, <clears throat> um, her daughter is ordained, and she is uh, uh, at um, uh, Columbia Theological Seminary as director of admissions. And she uh, said that uh, her daughter tells her that a large majority of the seminary students are women. Uh, and this, this, is, this is happening. You know, one of the things that kind of bothers me, uh, I think that we need to be colleagues, men and women. We need to learn how to be colleagues, how to work together and forget that we are different uh, physically, but we have common thoughts, common abilities, and and common calls. And what what I um, well, I'll tell you the story that why it bothers me. I was preaching at Trinity Presbyterian Church down here in Venice, and after. Uh, I, the sermon I preached was the one that I was asked to do about ordination of women. And afterwards, everybody had gone and they greeted me and so on. And there I was uh, ready to leave. And this one man, man was standing there. And uh, he said, uh, well, I'm, I'm a Baptist minister. And uh, he said, uh, uh, I'm against ordination of women. And he said, if you look at the history of the world, all of the nations that, that finally fall and disappear are the nations that are run by women. Uh -huh. well, that, that, really, that really disturbed me. You know, I couldn't agree. There was no debating with him, but... Um, uh, he left, and the pastor of that church has no idea who that person was. He just sort of walked in that Sunday, I guess. Uh, but uh, I think somehow uh, we don't want to over um, oversupply one or the other, and uh, and I think that women have uh, a sensitivity, uh, an ability uh, <clears throat> that is more patient than a lot of the um, our male colleagues, but that's not completely, totally honest, I guess. Um, but that just sort of illustrates, uh, I think, what your question was. But I am concerned about that. That, um, but there are so many, so many churches. Yeah, okay. They say, all right, the women can be ordained and go to the little small rural churches and so on. But I think that women are called to go to churches of any size. But we do need, I think, to uh, do something about either. Uh, the churches that are meeting in in storefronts and in homes and so on. I think we do need pastoral leadership there. Does that answer your question? Yes. yes. Or fogs it up more. <laughs> no, it helps. Thank you. Others. You know, Margaret, um, I read that at your ordination, the charge given included the words, go and be a shepherd to the sheep, not <laughs> the toy lamb. And yeah, I think that's what you're pointing to, not to be a token woman at a small church with small responsibilities, but equality so that the one who is most gifted is serving where there's a good fit um, so that the church's 
across the country and around the world flourish. What Herb Schrader really meant by that uh, in my ordination uh, was don't become a pet, <laughs> but become a leader. Yeah. Uh, be strong uh, in your leadership, strong and, and loving and kind, but do not become a pet. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to follow up with you. I, I thought I read that First Presbyterian Church Allentown never invited you to participate in leading worship or celebrating communion. Um, that in a sense there, it sounded like you were relegated to Christian education yeah. ministries. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, as I said, the, uh, the ministers were not really in favor of ordination, but um, as a political <laughs> political move, uh, I invited them to both participate in my ordination service. Um, uh, one of them doing the sermon, and one of them doing the pastoral prayer. And uh, by that, you know, they had to uh, acknowledge somehow <laughs> the ordination of women and and participate in it. Anyway, uh, when we returned to Allentown, um, there were things that uh, I was excluded from. Uh, one was what you have referred to. Uh, whenever communion was served, I never was invited or allowed to serve with the communion in the sanctuary. Instead, they had me pantomime the service in the fellowship hall, which was broadcast over loudspeakers. Um, so uh, the other thing was that uh, the ministers of Presbytery uh, got together, or several of the ministers in an area got together and uh, met with, uh, uh, came for supper, their wives prepared the supper and uh, uh, the, the men got together and discussed a paper that one of them presented. Well, uh, I wanted to go with the discussion, but no, they said, you stay here with the women and, uh, and uh, work on the supper. Okay, so I did the first time. Fortunately, um, the pastor of the Little Westminster Church in Allentown married the director or the professor of education at Princeton Seminary. And they came back and she and I covenanted that the next discussion group we were going to, and we did. <laughs> so we brought that. Yeah, those That's stories great. were all true. And, and, you know, but, it, you know, um, some of my, um, some of the gals that followed me were a little angry with me or impatient with me because I didn't get more aggressive and say, come on now, you need to accept women, do this or get more aggressive. I felt that what had to happen is the people of the churches needed to see what a pastor was, whether they were a man or a woman. And I felt that I needed to move into all of these ministries gently, rather than being uh, terribly aggressive or forceful. And that was my my theology of, of kind of just letting them get to know how I would perform pastorally. I did get to do a lot of preaching in some of the other presbytery churches. Yeah, you were never asked to preach at First Presbyterian Allentown. No, no, yeah. no. And when we did get to uh, First Press in, in Kalamazoo, I was asked to preach, but the secretary always got a phone call asking who was preaching. 
And if that woman is preaching, I'm not coming. <clears throat> um, and quick question, didn't you receive hate mail for years? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know how many years, but uh, upon my ordination with after all of that publicity and time and life and all of the newspapers and so on, I did receive uh, letters from uh, uh, women who uh, uh, were worried that uh, um, the women would uh, displace their husbands in, in the, the church. Uh, another woman, uh, well, several women did a lot of uh, 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 talking about the scripture as being against the ordination of women. Uh, Etc. So yes, that was true. I've lost you. Uh, okay, we're still oh, here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, I'm, I'm losing your picture. Uh, we'll fix that. Thank you, Nick. Anyway, yes, there were letters uh, saying that I was uh, uh, insulting God, that I was working against. Uh, uh, Jesus Christ and the Bible says women shouldn't speak in church, etc. Uh, we we all know those <laughs> scripture passages, and, and but so there were a lot of people that uh, were uh, standing by their interpretation, and it still happens. But um, I don't know as I'd call it hate mail now. The other that long letter that I had was five pages. Um, the woman evidently was emotionally unstable. Uh, yes, Kim. What's your best takeaway from her experience as a sexual her life as a Okay. What's your best takeaway as the first woman ordained as a female pastor who served in the Presbyterian Church USA. Um, what's your best takeaway from your life in ministry? My best takeaway of that? Yes. Well, I, um, I, I feel that uh, I have so much, uh, so many friends, so much affirmation and support um, and uh, I guess the feeling that um, periodically I will get a, a note from uh, say one of the young people that had been in my youth group um, uh, saying what, uh, what they had uh, meant, um, uh, how I had meant so much to them in their own ministry. There's one couple uh, who live in um, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, they were uh, a couple in my youth group uh, and they eventually uh, got married and, and uh, uh, are both ordained elders now and uh, youth workers in, in their church in Ann Arbor. And uh, uh, they um, actually were going to be here in a couple of weeks. Uh, but I, I guess the satisfaction that I get and the feeling of support that I get from some of the uh, people that, whose, whose lives I evidently touched in some way or another, uh, I, he I keep hearing from different people uh, of what uh, my ministry had meant to them, whether they are adults or, or young people. Um, my takeaway is that my pastoring, my method of pastoring uh, was that which um, helped to help people know the love and uh, support of Jesus Christ and um, uh, that we are all to care about our neighbors, to care about those who are um, 
invalids, to care about those who are discriminated against, as I said, due to race and so on. Um, I find that I am surprised and I guess I, I should feel really gratified at uh, the response of people that I, whose ministry I've been getting. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's, it's deep down and it, it kind of gets to me because I just can't um, be so, well, I'm just so grateful for the fact that the, I felt that uh, God in Christ, and, and I'm a big Holy Spirit believer, mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit is in our lives right now, working and caring. And um, uh, even uh, uh, the pe uh, I became the, that sounds funny, but I became the, the burying pastor <laughs> of a couple of the churches because I would get called upon by the funeral homes uh, for people that had no churches at all, as well as our own parishioners. And uh, when I would finish, they would say, well, I didn't know you knew that person. And I said, well, I, I really didn't. But what you told me about him, I knew him or her. Uh, but I guess it's the, grat the feeling that I must have done something right. But <laughs> just like um, this in The Sound of Music, <laughs> she said that she must have done something right. That's great. Yes. At any point, did she feel discouraged enough to give up, or did she always was she always determined to move on? Yeah. At any point, Margaret, did you feel discouraged and tempted to give up, or were you always determined to carry on? I think I would be dishonest to say I wasn't. Uh, there were a number of times, uh, even at seminary, well, I wondered if I really belonged there. Um, in fact, I went in to talk to my advisor, John Bennett, uh, about my two and a half years into my seminary and said, you know, a lot of the stuff that that my classmates are are bringing up or, or saying and so on. Uh, I'm confused. And I said, maybe I don't belong here. And John Bennett, I always remembered, said to me, Margaret, you're not the one that's confused. <laughs> <laughs> that, it, yes, of course I felt. I think we would all be dishonest if we said, we did not have times of discouragement uh, and um, uh, and questioning. Uh, right now, I'm learning to live with pain, and that's a, a hard kind of a task to do because I have two and a half bionic hips, and neither one of them can be re uh, um, operated on because they said I'm too old. So I'm learning to live with pain, and that gets to be uh, a challenge too. But um, I think that there are always times when we have a discouragement, and then all of a sudden, something happens that God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, speaks through somebody or some incident and really buoys you up. And, and keeps you going and, and knowing that uh, God's spirit is there and surrounding you and working with you. I'll bet you get discouraged too once in a while, Tom. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, and you have helped to buoy me. You have helped to lift my spirit, so thank you. Any other questions? Women's associations have always been a, a great supporter of me. And uh, I'm, I have an, I'm an honorary member of the Women's Association 
from way back in about 19, oh, 19, uh, about 1970. So I, I'm a member of the Women's Association and I'm, I'm proud of the work that they have been doing. And I must say that they've always been, most of them have always been very supportive of women in ministry and of, of my ministry. That's great. I think we are all honored to have been having this conversation. Absolutely. Luann says we all have been honored to have this conversation with you. Yes. Well, I hope that it. I hope it is what you had wanted. I, you know, you you sent me a bunch of questions, and it was sort of like giving my speech about ordination. And, and I just had a feeling that this dialogue would be better since you can read about a lot of the stuff that I would have said in a canned speech. Um, and I hope that uh, uh, some of this has been different. Uh, my memoirs are uh, now in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, being edited to go to the, um, the uh, Historical Society in Philadelphia. And uh, one of the honors that I had was that uh, uh, the Women's Association out West wanted to have my portrait painted and it hangs right next to uh, uh, Bill, um, one, of, one of the stated clerks in uh, the Historical Society in Philadelphia. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Okay, well, uh, would you join me, please, in thanking Margaret? Thank you. Okay, are we done? Yes. Um, let's let's close in prayer. Okay, Margaret. Yeah, I've lost it. We should. Oh, here. Good. Okay. Let us pray. Or do you want to pray? Yeah, let me do it. Okay, please do. <clears throat> Loving and gracious God, surround us with your spirit, the spirit of love and compassion, the spirit of hope, the spirit of movement, the movement to infuse all of us with the kind of spirit that will help our church, not only in Worthington, but also in the world, to build a world where there is no war, where there is peace, where we learn to love and care for one another. We give you thanks for the women of Worthington and for their pastors and his wife and for all that are busy carrying the spirit of Christ into the world. Surround us and surround them now as they go each their own ways, even slushing through the snow and give us the peace of Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Okay, Tom, I'm leaving. Okay, God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you. Peace be with you. And peace be with you. Amen.